afternoon and welcome to uh, those of us who have joined us online. Uh, this is the panel uh, which is called um, The Court is in Session, uh, The Growing Role of Litigation to Shape Legal and Policy Developments. Uh, and the court is the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court is not in session, but we are. And to, uh, to preside over that panel, I have really three really distinguished panelists who look at this issue of intersection of litigation and politics <laughs> from various perspectives. Um, and uh, their, their bios are in the, in the handout that you have, and I really, they're so distinguished and long, it'll take me a long time to, to recite them. I will not do that, but briefly, um, on my immediate right, uh, is Christy D. Pena. She is Vice President of Policy and Director of Immigration at the Niskanen Center. Uh, uh, immediately on her right is Suzanne Gamba, a veteran uh, reporter on immigration uh, policy issues, and now a senior national reporter in NBC Latino and stationed in Texas. And joining me online is uh, my dear old friend and colleague, Christina Rodriguez, who is a chair professor at Yale Law School, as also before that. I got it. There we are. Hi, Christina, uh, who, uh, who has uh, served at the, at the Office of Legal Counsel in the DOJ in the Obama administration and is an occasional consultant to the Department of Justice, but most importantly, she is one of our most nervous board members of MPI. Uh, so welcome to all three of you. So as I said, the court is not in session, but we are. And we are today looking at how immigration is playing out in the federal courts and playing out in, in the Supreme Court especially, and what the ramifications of what court does has in the world of politics. And let me just f start with Christina, if you don't mind, uh, just because you have been a clerk at the Supreme Court, you have watched the Supreme Court over time. And I think I will say this without fear of contradiction, that Supreme Court has never been more busy on immigration as it has been in the last few years. Everything from the, in the Trump administration to the Biden administration, from travel bans to census to public charge to MPP to the re recent decision on prosecutorial discretion, it has covered a swath on issues. And so after Robert's court now, probably we'll have seen most challenges to the executive authority on immigration than probably any court in history. And so at the end of the Trump administration and the beginning of the Biden administration, how, do we, how would you tell us where have we landed on Supreme Court's view on the discretion of the president in immigration writ large? Thank you, Moose, and thanks to everyone at MPI and at Georgetown for having me here. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm excited to have this conversation over Zoom and, and with you. Uh, Moose, you're not wrong to think that this is uh, an era of unprecedented litigation at the Supreme Court over immigration matters. It, it has long been the case that the INA generates a steady diet of cases of statutory interpretation and sometimes constitutional questions before the court. But I think that uh, the rise in the executive branch's use of its policymaking tools to shape immigration policy and the subsequent litigation has meant that the court has uh, had a number of cases that implicate those policymaking tools on its docket in ways we haven't seen before. Some of that, or much of that, has to do with how we've seen dramatic swings in immigration policy over the last three administrations, and I would date what you're describing back to the Obama years. That has been combined with a slog in the courts and arguably an acceleration of judicial intervention to constrain and block executive policymaking. And there could be a number of different factors that have contributed to that. But I think there's no question that we're seeing the judicialization of executive branch policy. In recent years and, and just this past term, I think the Supreme Court itself 
has mainly reinforced considerable executive control over immigration policy, though the lower courts have made that a protracted process that has prevented administrations from implementing some of their signature initiatives. And there are also potential developments on the horizon, some of which are the product of recent precedents by the Supreme Court that could have a seriously constraining effect, especially with respect to policies central to this administration. And I thought it might be helpful, Moose, and you could tell me if you want to talk about a, a different feature of this to start by talking about the MPP wind down just a little bit, because I think that it embodies this tension between uh, a jurisprudence that remains uh, open to executive branch policymaking, but trends in the courts that actually might constrain important dimensions of the executive's policymaking abilities. So I think in this audience, MPP probably doesn't require much definition, but maybe I'll say a little bit about what it is and then what's happened and what that might suggest about where we're headed. And, and uh, some of these principles or some of these predictions would apply to any number of the executive branch policies that are currently either headed for litigation or stuck in litigation. So uh, MPP was a program uh, begun by the Trump administration. MPP is an acronym for Migrant Protection Protocols. It's also known as the Remain in Mexico policy and was part of a larger effort to crack down on illegal border crossers and limit the reach of the asylum laws. It relies on two sections of the INA, including a provision that's been used on an ad hoc basis before, uh, but was used systematically by the Trump administration to return non-Mexican nationals arriving by land to Mexico to await the removal proceedings. Um, so the policy was adopted against an important backdrop to all executive branch policymaking, and that is that the government has never been able to detain all people who are authorized to be detained, maybe even mandatorily so under the statutes. And, and previously, the government would release people on parole or some other grounds. But MPP was the answer of the Trump administration uh, to large numbers of people at the border. Well, following the change in administration on January 20th, 2021, there was an attempt to rescind MPP. And I, I won't go through all of the details of the back and forth, even though they do matter to the litigation. And uh, not long after it was announced that it would be rescinded, one of these dynamics that I know that we'll talk about today entered the picture with Texas and Missouri seeking to enjoin uh, the, um, at first the failure to enroll people uh, in MPP, but then subsequently uh, a challenge to the actual decision by the administration to rescind MPP. So uh, long story short, um, the case eventually made its way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court did three things that matter to the future of executive control over immigration policy. The first was that it applied a ruling from earlier in the term that found that the INA limits district court's abilities to issue injunctions on a class-wide basis to address a number of different provisions, to implement a number of different provisions of the immigration code. And so this question about whether this tool of the injunction, which has been used by courts to stymie administrative policy efforts by both Republican and Democratic administrations is, is now an open question. But secondly, the court found uh, discretion in the INA and rejected the arguments of the states and of the Fifth Circuit and of the district court that uh, MPP was the only alternative to mandatory detention for people who arrived at the border and weren't clearly entitled to be admitted. Um, the, the way in which the court did this was extremely important, I think, because it relied in part on longstanding practice of the executive branch that since 1996, no administration has treated this so-called contiguous territory provision as mandatory, that the executive retained discretion uh, to use it or not. And whether it was otherwise comporting with its detention obligations did not make the provision mandatory. Um, the court in doing this also recognized the government's parole authority uh, as something that at least existed to be used on a case-by-case -case basis. It didn't address whether the Biden administration has been using parole in a lawful fashion, but it did acknowledge its existence as a tool. Um, and then finally, and this is where there might be some ominous clouds and, and um, potential for further mischief with executive efforts to um, shape immigration policy, the court returned the case to the district court 
to have the court consider whether the administration's rescission of MPP was consistent with the Administrative Procedure Act, um, whether it was arbitrary and capricious. Now, in the case, the Fifth Circuit has also already given us a, a very clear answer. Uh, it thinks that it was, in fact, arbitrary and capricious. This is separate from whether it was mandated by statute. It's whether the administration gave good enough reasons for its goals. And uh, the Fifth Circuit's analysis um, was not just your typical review for rationality. It was a very intrusive policy discussion uh, that, that attempted to hold the administration's feet to the fire. Um, and this is where we're going next. This same idea that courts can really scrutinize the reasons that an administration gives for adopting a policy has also affected the en enjoining of the Mayorkas enforcement priority memos, where the court is not just accepting that the executive has discretion to make choices about how to enforce the law, it's actually looking at the studies that it cites and finding reasons that it failed to consider alternatives. And you know, the last thing I'll say here is that um, the court in the civil enforcement priorities case, another Texas district court, and we could talk about this case in some more detail, traced its analysis to the Supreme Court's decision in the Regents decision, which is the case in which Supreme Court found the Trump administration had not lawfully rescinded DACA, which some people consider a big win, but in that opinion uh, are the legal tools to prevent a subsequent administration from changing immigration policy to meet its priorities. And that's where we are now, Moose, is uh, state litigants with administrative law tools able to stand in the way of administrations seamlessly implementing their immigration policies that we once thought were well within uh, their discretionary authority. So in law uh, person's language, could we say Supreme Court is basically saying the president has a lot of authority in immigration, but it must do it right? That, that's a, that's one way of saying it, yes. <laughs> uh, but the, doing it right is where the, the, the battle is. So let me just stick with you for a, for a second on this. So you, you mentioned right in the beginning of the analysis that uh, this decision and I think other recent decisions have for the first time in a long time started showing Supreme Court's lack of appetite for single federal court judges issuing nationwide injunctions because that has been the practice for a long. So where are we today on the ability of single court justices uh, issuing nationwide injunctions? This is a long simmering issue and it's not limited to immigration law. Uh, I think that uh, there are two important considerations. One is, one is specific to immigration law. And in the Aleman Gonzalez versus Garland case from last term that the court then cites in the MPP case, the court interprets a provision of the INA that says um, that no court except for the Supreme Court shall have jurisdiction to enjoin or restrain the operation of certain provisions of the INA to preclude in that particular case, which involved class-wide uh, bond hearings, uh, from issuing um, injunctions other than in cases that involve single individuals. In a case like Alman Gonzalez, what that means then is that individuals then have to bring uh, cases on their own without the benefit of aggregation. But it also could potentially mean that injunctions have been issued uh, against a lot of administration policies are no longer valid under this provision. That remains to be litigated. Um, and whether something falls within the terms of the statute is a, is a case by case kind of determination. The, the decision and Alamon Gonzalez also does not address whether lower courts can vacate opinions for violations of the Administrative Procedure Act, this arbitrary and capricious or otherwise contrary to law set of principles. And that is that is another way in which district courts can make a considerable amount of mischief by vacating those policies. So that, that is another dimension of this that needs to be litigated. But I do think you're right that some of the judges, including dissenters in the Alman Gonzalez case, because it was a statutory case, are uh, growing impatient with the ability of a single district court to stop the implementation of a national policy. Just last week, Justice Kagan gave a speech where she criticized the district court nationwide injunction, as well as the forum shopping that is a partner to those injunctions, where a litigants go to a court that they think is likely to rule in their favor. It leads to not only the uh, stymieing of 
federal policy, but it further politicizes the courts in a way that at least she and, and others find um, a worrisome trend. Right. Yeah, I couldn't get a better summary of uh, this. So let me just uh, shift to Christy. So we know that the Supreme Court uh, did not allow Trump administration to end DACA, uh, but it was then brought back on the merits. And Judge Hannon in district court in Texas said uh, DACA was unlawful. And uh, he let the current recipients continue to receive, but no one else. Yeah. Uh, and that's now an appeal in Fifth Circuit. So obviously one of these dangling issues in litigation is DACA, and probably one of the most prominent. I know you've been paying a lot of attention to DACA. Uh, first, tell me from your point of view, how do you expect things to come out in the Fifth Circuit? And, and we can all list what the outcomes could be That's right. and determine on those outcomes, or what do you think the next step is going to be? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think that, that a lot of folks in this room uh, whose faces I recognize, and it's great to see in person, um, have been paying, uh, you know, a lot of close attention to what's going on in DACA. Um, and I think that it it kind of harkens back to some of these decisions that Christina is talking about. You know, so the rescission of DACA told us a lot about the way that we can anticipate Justices Thomas and Alito and, Alito and Gorsuch to rule on uh, an eventual case that may make its way up to the Supreme Court, as everyone's sort of guessing that it will. I think looking back at some of the, even the DAPA litigation in 2015, you know, we saw a conversation among Supreme Court justices about the merits of a program that is very similar to DACA. Um, and so I think that we're going to see a very similar message and, and debate about the merits. But I think that there is an important distinction about what happened in DAPA that didn't happen in, or that is happening, happening in the DACA case. And that there has been some kind of judicial recognition about the contributions that uh, DACA recipients have had over the past decade, and certainly the reliance that they have placed on a program that has been in place for, for 10 years. So while I don't think, to your question, Moose, that that's going to really influence the way that the court um, finds uh, on the outcome of the case, I don't think that it looks good for DACA recipients. I think that it's a pretty bleak outcome that we can anticipate from both the Fifth Circuit and eventually um, the Supreme Court. What I do think that that lends itself to is really making the case to lawmakers that this is number one, an incredibly urgent issue, and number two, that there is all of this really widespread recognition, not only on the part of you know all the players that that submitted amicus briefs in some of these cases, but even amongst some of the the judges and you know the the DO, uh, DHS in talking about these cases about really the impact the Dreamers have had on the U.S. and I think that that is going to be influential in um, their response to whatever it is that, that the courts find in the next uh, weeks and months. And so there's been a lot of great data that's come out, um, of course, from a lot of the organizations that I see here on the economic, the financial, the societal, the familiar repercussions of, you know, what can really happen to the roughly 610 to 700,000 folks that have DACA right now. And so, again, I don't think that impacts what the courts decide, but I do, I am hopeful that it's going to be persuasive to the folks that can and arguably should be intervening even before we have the courts talk about um, an outcome. Uh, yeah, let me not let you get away so quickly. Uh, sure. But, you know, since uh, Hannon issued the decision, I mean, following up on Christina's logic, if you accept that the current uh, standing on Supreme Court and President's authority, you must do it. You have a lot of authority, but you must do it right. Right. Since the Supreme Court last, there is now a new rule on DACA. It took the administration time to issue it. So you could argue that the new rule does beef up the administration's position in defense of DACA. You don't, you don't see it that way? You know, I think that it was a good message. I think it was the right message. And I, I truthfully think it was the only message that the administration could have put out there. I don't see personally that there was really anything that they could have done uh, administratively that would have changed what's happening, what we're anticipating in the Fifth Circuit. Um, I think that there was a possibility that it, you know, if they'd gone even further potentially in that rule, 
uh, that, you know, Judge Hanen could have come back and lifted his own stay on the current policy that it's allowing renewals to continue. Um, so, you know, I think it was kind of the only move for the administration to make. But again, it reinforces this idea that we now know. There's, you know, just boatloads of evidence that we all know about in this room that talk about the value of dreamers, the impact on the United States of having uh, DAC recipients come here and work here, you know, all the teachers that we have. I mean, all of these things are, are narratives that I know that you're all very familiar with. Um, and I think that that, that was, that was kind of the only move. I don't think that it's going to change in any way the outcome of, of the court. So, Christina, what, what's your view as a lawyer? I mean, the fact that, as you put, that the Supreme Court is looking at explain it to us well, and this rule essentially does that. Doesn't it fortify DACA better than before? It certainly fortifies DACA, and that's the word that was used, I believe, in the executive order, uh, and provides more context um, for the, the policy, which applies to the same people to whom it originally applied. Uh, I, I tend to agree, though, that its road in the court will be, in the courts generally, but will be rocky at best. The variable I would introduce is uh, the possibility that the Supreme Court will apply this so-called major questions doctrine that it has been developing over the last several years and used in um, an environmental case this past term to say that the EPA had enacted rules that were not expressly authorized by Congress, but addressed a, a major question of social economic significance. The way in which it might apply is not to the, the concept of enforcement forbearance altogether. I, I have some hope that that uh, will will be regarded, even if it's on a categorical basis, as something that is within the executive's authority, but with respect to work authorization. And, and I think that the, and the question is whether the fact that the work authorization rule has been in place since the 1980s and is just being applied to this new category of people will be sufficient. And even though this is not on all fours with the way the major questions doctrine has been used, because uh, it involves um, the extension of a rule and not necessarily an interpretation of a statute. It might be the case that the court will say that rule contemplated ad hoc, small scale authorizations for people who didn't otherwise have authorization under uh, the statute, but DACA contemplates something on an entirely distinct scale. And without some kind of congressional expression on that question, it's not within the administration's authority to do that. I do think that would be incredibly disruptive, uh, but something along those lines is not outside of the realm of possibility. And you know, I think it was alluded to before, that is somewhat of the roadmap that Chief Justice Robert Ga Roberts gave in the Regents' decision itself. Um, and I think they, they're probably just going to drive right down that road if it gets to them. Can I jump on that? So quickly, yeah. Very quickly. I think that you're you're calling out something that's so important, Christina, which is the elephant in the room here, right? That there has been no congressional expression here. So I know everyone in this room knows that, but it's worth repeating. It's worth bearing um, a little bit, uh, you know, spending a little bit of time on it because this doesn't actually have to be a question before the courts. We don't actually have to be thinking about the major questions doctrine and the scope of executive authority, you know, in this way if Congress was willing to act on something that there has been widespread consensus about across political lines for a decade, and they've just failed to do so. So wear your political hat now, and I know you okay. You spend your time in the right of center politics. Right. Uh, so we have, I have argued at least that all branches of our government have been saved by the other branch on the DACA, uh, that Congress doesn't need to act because as long as it's in litigation, and they have enough protection, we really don't need to act. But the can cannot be pushed down very far. At the end, if the Supreme Court rules on DACA and rules it unlawful, that's the end of the road on the can. So at that point, what kind of pressure will be put on members of Congress, especially the Republicans, given the moral challenge of the DACA recipients? It's a very good question, and it's a very hard one to answer. 
I mean, ideally, the answer is that it will be a lot of pressure, and it will be so much pressure that is persuasive to act. But uh, of course, we don't we don't actually know if it is going to be persuasive enough. I'm sure that it's going to rely on whatever exit time frame that either the Fifth Circuit or the Supreme Court comes up with. I'm sure it's going to depend on what the timeline for deportations may or may not look like. Um, so all of those questions sort of outstanding. I, I do think that there is a very, very small window that Congress could act in in the next handful of weeks on something that is extraordinarily narrow in this space. But there are so many poison pills out there that could potentially derail any kind of negotiations among you know, Republicans and Democrats. And of course, we're hearing about them front and center this week, and I'm sure that we'll, we'll touch on them a little bit later. Um, but you know, if, if we try to tackle big questions on immigration reform, like anything on asylum, I would, I would probably um, propose is, is the end of negotiations and, and really um, stops any kind of potentially narrow fix on, on, a, on a congressional solution for DACA. Uh, so, you know, I would never come up here and say that the window is closed forever. I always think that there is a little bit of hope, but I think that it is dwindling. And I think that, you know, potentially a, a new Republican Congress uh, next year is going to be very unlikely to be persuaded um, by the ending of this program. Okay, Suzanne, now on to you. Uh, so, you know, we used to think of Arizona as the ground zero on immigration in the last 10 years on state action. And now Texas has essentially become the government in exile for the Trump administration <laughs> to ch challenge everything that the Obama administration is doing. And no one watches Texas as closely as you do. <laughs> Could you tell us what the hell is going on in Texas? I mean, <laughs> is, is, the, is Governor Abbott just walking into a vacuum created by the inaction by Congress? Or is he really a proxy for the Trump administration? Or does it really reflect the politics of Texas? Uh, I think you can answer almost all of those with a yes, although maybe you might change the proxy um, change the proxy uh, word just because I don't think Greg Abbott would like it very much. He wants to be his own man. And, um, and really, I mean, I, I, I want to answer that question with um, telling all of you all, um, uh, I've done this for a long time and um, so much so that I think I actually kind of got tired of the intransigence on immigration, which I, I covered a lot um, and, and then actually ended up leaving Washington after 18 years and going back to Texas to try to cover things in the field and get a real idea of what was going on in the ground and, and what's really happening, which is where I started. I was El Paso correspondent in, in, uh, for the Associated Press for a while. In that time, Greg Abbott, he was, I don't know if any of you all know, he was the Attorney General of Texas, and it was interesting to see the Attorney General talking today and then think about him, but he once spoke of immigrants as, as crime victims. He would excuse me, and he would use his office to protect them. He protected them against notarios. Um, he protected them against uh, wage theft. Um, he once, he's been credited um, in, I think, the, like about around 2007, something like that, to, for stopping a slate of um, anti-immigrant bills in the legislature. Um, and he once said, um, for, or actually not once, but had said it for a number of times, that immigration enforcement was not Texas's job. So what's the pivot point? Well, year, years later, about 2014, Texas has changed itself. So it's not just um, Governor Abbott, but Texas itself, which was a, um, a republic, had a, its Republican streak was more business oriented. And that was kind of its pride point that, that we were about, um, uh, that we being Texas uh, were about, you know, being a, a place where business could thrive. There was, but there was always a, super conservative wing of the Republican Party that was very much based on the abortion issue um, and where they once, you know, rejected Kay Bailey Hutchison as a delegate uh, for the convention and um, and George W. Bush stood with her and took some uh, backlash and, and, and that has continued into his, his nephew who's not accepted by the far right of what is now the Republican Party. And this has become his base and this is now, how, where his immigration um, policy uh, comes from and has brought us to years later as you go down the line is it, it has gotten harder and hardened and hardened more and more. He's, there's been different iterations of what is now called Operation Lone Star, 
Uh, Rick Perry did his versions of them when he was governor, but this is like the newest and probably one of the, as as they said, I think in a description of the of this panel, the the most muscly one that <laughs> that we're seeing right now. Um, uh, as as a reporter, I mean, I, you know, it's my job to, to to hear people from both sides. And when I was in El Paso and I lived there, and this was in the early '80s, you know, you I I would see Latinos who Mexicanos or whatever that lived on the border, and their their homes were broken into by by uh, I, I don't want to call them gangs because they weren't organized, but they were young guys that came and they would do property theft, and so they were. Um, supportive of having more enforcement from the Border Patrol to stop this. Um, at, at the same time, you know, we, we had the farm work, a lot of farm worker stuff there uh, going on. And um, anyway, so, um, you know, this has all um, uh, been a, a change in, in, in what's going on uh, politically. It's, it's, it's been a, a bigger uh, uh, issue. What you see right now with Operation Lone Star, the equivalent, I think, of the, um, the folks that, that had the property theft are the ranchers who are complaining. I, I've not seen the complaints. I've not witnessed the actual damage other reporters have. Um, that, and I, I sat in, or I listened in on a hearing um, uh, that was just held in Eagle Pass, Texas, um, to decide whether or not more money should go to Operation Lone Star, which is already at about $4 billion. Um, and and they were talking Sorry, about describe for people what operation was yeah yeah let me I, I was about to get to that a lot of these ranchers were talking about the damage to their fences holes cut in them uh, immigrants crossing through their their ranches and and what you have to imagine is there's this just kind of open space out there and and people don't know where they are they don't know they're on private property or whatever but Operation Lone Star that um, uh, the governor has set up brings a basic at its basic uh, level is um, uh, he's deployed a thousand um, Texas Department of Public Safety troopers and National Guard to the border. The troopers are were initially to stop people who were crossing the border and, and coming on uh, private land and and using the state law criminal trespass to uh, prosecute them. They're to be prosecuted under um, that. Um, uh, state misdemeanor. Um, there are enhancements to it. If it's on agricultural property, I think it bumps it to a, a, a class B. And then if another crime is committed, it's a class A and a felony. Um, uh, oftentimes, these are people who are lost. They're looking for water. They get it how they can, whether that's entering a home, uh, a hunting shack that might be on a ranch. And some of that is leading to other kinds of charges uh, against these people. There's also um, a lot more um, uh, traffic patrol on the on the back roads and on the roads of the small towns that are on the border, particularly in a city called Brackettville, Del Rio, Eagle Pass, and people are being stopped. One of the last stories I wrote was um, about the numerous people that were are local citizens and are being stopped by um, the Department of Public Safety and being um, not only are they being asked where are you going, uh, hey your tail lights out by the way where are you going, um, you know where did you come from, why are you on the road, uh, who are your passengers? Texas is a state where you don't have to identify as a passenger, you know turn over your ID card, etc. And they're demanding that of passengers. If you don't, they threaten arrest. Um, people are complaining that they're being searched. Um, of course, this is one group of people, you also have the ranchers that are seeking protection. Uh, so anyway, that, a lot of that is going on. And, um, you know, so Abbott has really sort of, I, I was talking to an attorney, there's a lawsuit that was filed um, against some of, uh, against this and, and, and because of the many civil rights issues that are going on in this. And um, uh, one of the things they point out in the lawsuit is not only is, is, is this going on, but they've also, he's also gone so far as to, um, well, the, the counties, because the counties are empowered to do a lot of things, they have created their own judges and, and picked their own judges to decide the prosecutions, uh, decide you know how, uh, the cases of the criminal trespass or whatever. So the county uh, judge, in which is the executive um, officer of a county, is the person who hears the case. But because there were so many cases that this county of about 3,000 people was not prepared for uh, many more cases than they would ever get in a year. Um, they appointed some retired judges. The retired judges that were initially appointed were not ruling in the way they wanted them to. They were cognizant of civil rights, et cetera, and were dismissing cases. So the guy in charge of them, uh, 
dismissed them and brought in the ones that would rule it the way he wanted them to. And so you have this whole system. It's not just judges. It's where they're detaining people, how they're doing it, that um, an attorney expressed to me was a, uh, a separate criminal justice system for immigrants that's going on in Texas right now. Oh, uh, great. And then, so mm -hmm. is busing just an inheritor of the Lone Star operation? The, is this the most recent chapter? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. The busing of immigrants. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. That's, a, that's also a prong of it. And, you know, I, it's a political year. Um, he's up for uh, re-election. He, he was at 1.5 points separated from the Democrat. Um, he's now at nine points from the latest Dallas Morning News UT Tyler poll. And, um, you know, he, he's tried a lot of things. So I don't know if you remember that he tried to shut down. Uh, well, not shut down. He tried to re-inspect some of the trucks coming across uh, the many, many uh, bridges that we have in Texas, and it just created such a backup, and then there was such an outcry, and the Mexicans, you know, uh, protested, and and um, it it affected the bottom line. I think there was it was about four. I want anyway, millions lost in um, commerce, and so he didn't do it. He stopped um, after the immigrants died died in the um, the trailer. Um, the the what was it? 52 people um, in the back of the tractor trailer truck, he announced that he was going to do um, uh, strike teams to inspect tractor trailer rigs. Uh, I haven't seen anything yet. Not, that does, I haven't done any the reporting to look for it because I do a lot of other things too, but um, uh, it right away created some, was problematic because the state does not have the authority to open up a truck. So there was a lot of questions about how are they going to do this. So I don't know if the busing was is to move on from that, um, but it's clear, you know, Abbott is looking for the attention. What's what's interesting, if I could just say about Martha's Vineyard, is up to this point, you know, I've been wondering, like, is you know the whole immigration thing just not going to be an issue in this election? Like, is it just kind of nobody cares? Um, yes, I know Republicans care from their end, but you know we were showing it among Latino voters like number five um, on, term, on the list of what they care about. And this, I think, is they want it elevated because they want people against it. But I think also you all, it, it's, it's, you know, hitting the people who don't like, who are more humanitarian, what, don't want to see this kind of thing. So let's stick to, Christina, let's stick to busing for a second because it has just garnered the country's attention so much. Uh, so in the past, we used to kind of think of, you know, I'm just asking you as one of the country's best experts on federalism. We used to think about Republican states going after Democratic uh, administrations or Democratic states going after Republican administrations. Now, here's the first time you have states going against each other. Uh, and you could call it sort of, you know, a civil war going on between states. Pardon the, the, uh, the expression. Uh, how unprecedented is, is it? Uh, either in immigration or in any in our uh, federal system of government in general? Well, there's a long history of disagreements among states and uh, differences of view and different relationships to the federal government uh, among the states. It dates back to the 19th century when there were some states on the Eastern seaboard that tried to adopt their own deportation laws at the same time that there were states in the now Midwest trying to recruit immigrants for settlement purposes. And it might've been less pitched and in direct conflict with one another, but the, the very different approaches that states have taken through their laws and policies to try to shape immigration to serve their interests is a longstanding dynamic in US history despite um, the increased federalization of immigration law since the early 20th century. The, the busing example reminds me a little bit of, or a lot of the reaction that a number of states had in 2015 to the possibility that Syrian refugees during the major crisis there would be resettled. And the declaration by people like Mike Pence, who was the governor of Indiana and others, that they would refuse resettlement. That was less a conflict with other states per se, and again, a conflict with the federal government, but it was a political stance taken to try to resist 
what they believe to be the implications of lax immigration policy that is not just the fault of the federal government, but is abetted by states that purport to be sanctuaries or to want to recruit immigrants because they fit into the way that their economies function or the way their societies um, are, are structured. And so uh, in, in that sense, it's part of the long tradition. I hesitate to call what's happening now federalism. That gives a little bit too grandiose a term for it. It's more like uh, political gamesmanship, but it's a part of a long tradition of states trying to set an agenda through very politically uh, incendiary tactics that often have um, anti-humanitarian consequences. So just clearly the key issue in, in this case is the, the humanitarian effects of, of what's going on for no good reason other than to make a, a political point. Yeah. So, Christy, on the other side, Democrats have been making noise, various governors, that they're looking at ways to go off to Texas legally. Uh, so the Attorney General of Connecticut, who was here this morning, very diplomatically said that they're looking at all kinds of possible claims, uh, civil, criminal, and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I know you thought about this. Can you think of what the legal issues this thing raises and whether any of them have legs or no? You know, I, I think it raises a, a lot of questions, and it sounds like a lot of people are thinking about those questions. We've heard folks bring up um, uh, potential human trafficking charges, kidnapping charges, run-of-the-mill fraud charges. Um, the Behar County Sheriff is looking at uh, looking at criminal charges himself. So there's a lot of eyeballs on this, which I think is important. But what I what I kind of also think is is an important um, way to think about this is is actually looking at some of the the costs that these states are talking about. Because if you push Governor DeSantis or you push Governor Abbott enough, it always comes back to the fact that they are sharing or they are they are taking on the lion's share of responsibility for uh, processing all of these asylum seekers. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to, as a nation, come out and say that we do want to better share some of the responsibility. But I also think that we need to be forthright about the fact that the federal government is not ignoring the fact that Texas bears this lion's share. Uh, just this year. They gave Texas $22 million that was explicitly focused on um, intercepting and, and handling some of the asylum seekers that are coming across the border. By my calculations um, that I've read from great reporters, uh, they're, they're saying that roughly Texas has spent something along the lines of $12 million just busing and moving migrants, um, you know, and so when you're thinking about the dollar amounts here, it immediately sort of detracts from this this claim that that this is all about money. It's it's clearly not. And I think that you're exactly right when you talk about um, the fact that that Governor Abbott is getting a huge political bump from this kind of staging. The other important thing that I think um, comes up on the legal side of things is that the federal government does to some extent really demand from state and local enforcement some kind of cooperation and it often costs them a lot of money to do so and that's why in the past even as recently as as 2017 we saw sanctuary jurisdictions in states like florida and in states like texas there was just a recent holding um, in los angeles county by a court that barred ice from relying on their uh, their um, uh, records to issue detainers because they were so unreliable. And the federal government wasn't paying for the costs of those settlements that had to be paid out to all of these people that were improperly detained via an ICE detainer. It was Los Angeles County and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And that's happening across the board in a lot of these states. So I think it's kind of a, a push and pull from some of this. But I do think that, you know, if we're looking at the silver lining of having some of these discussions, we are starting to think about the way that the U.S. as a country can better respond to some of these needs, not just relying on the states of sort of first asylum that we talk about uh, in the context of, of a global regime and, and thinking about how the U.S. can better respond as a whole to, to this need, because there is a way to respond efficiently and effectively and humanely um, to the needs that, that we're seeing. Right. Can I throw uh, so in something uh, real quick? I just I, I think it's real important too to that and the Texas um, 
situation um, that there had there wasn't a lot of transparency on what the results were uh, or have been on Operation Lone Star. And if, if you have a chance to look for the um, article that the Texas Tribune Marshall Project and ProPublica did, um, really investigating the numbers that were out there. And they found that like some of the criminal drug uh, uh, stats or, or cases that were connected by the governor's office to you know their their success stories were actually had nothing to do with the border. They were they were totally unassociated with it. So they they had to like take some two thousand cases out of their numbers uh, because it wasn't they weren't valid. That's not to say there's not some validity to what they're trying to do and the damage that some people suffer. But there's also in fact a federal program to help ranchers who do suffer damage. So as as Christy said, there there, there are programs that are trying to recognize that there's an issue out there. Uh, great. So stay with, let me stay with you. And again, just drawing your expertise as a veteran observer of Latino politics. So one of the points made in our panel this morning was that just because a lot of people, I can't say majority, but overwhelming numbers of migrants arriving at the border these days are from Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, that that's going to change the perception of people coming to the border, especially among Republicans. How do you see this playing in Latino politics today? Well, it's an important issue in Latino politics because, as you all know, there is this sort of effort after seeing how Trump did in the last election to try to uh, gain more uh, Latinos on the on the Republican side, and and that's kind of made Democrats scared, um, and and some are saying that they are trying to go after them as well, better than they have before. Um, it's what's really important to know is that in Texas there always has been this higher percentage of Hispanics or Latinos who would um, vote Republican on certain races, and that's all you need. You you could go as high as forty percent or thirty nine percent. Governor Abbott or Perry would get that percentage, and that was all they needed to win their race. And there are races out there. It may not matter on the national scale because you still have sixty percent who are voting Democrat. But if you are a Democrat, but if you um. But if, if you look at the, lo the, the smaller level, the lower level, it's, it's changing things. And what's really important about these immigration um, um, policies is that they are happening at the county level. Um, Greg Abbott's um, um, Operation Lone Star wouldn't work without the cooperation of the Kinney County attorney, I mean, Kinney County judge and the Kinney uh, Valverde County judge who um, all d agreed to, um, went, went in with him on declaring a disaster declaration. So, you know, to have a la la the Latino vote um, shift even, or, or and which I don't think is shift, I, I think it's more um, Republicans who haven't voted in the past because it was so Democrat in certain areas and are now participating more in primaries and in the election, um, and then some may be shifting, you know, that's, um, that can make a difference in those races where those people are coming up with the policies. And some of these counties, uh, at least in Texas, where they're, they're, you are seeing these um, different numbers on Latino voters are some of the, the poorest in the country. Um, and they have struggled for years. And the best jobs are with the Border Patrol and ICE. They offer benefits. Um, they you know offer a way for them to send their kids to college. And they already play into what is a something of a of a streak, a, a cultural streak of uh, patriotism, um, because for those that are are not so far removed as immigrants, you know, this is a way to show you're truly American, and that this whole issue I think does play to their to those strengths and weaknesses, whatever you want to call them. I think it's still a wild card to see how Venezuelans and Cubans and Colombians are going to react to seeing the deportations and the busing. We did a quick story uh, after the, Martha's Vineyard, uh, a colleague and I, and um, just trying to get a, a bead on the, the, Latin, uh, the Venezuelan community, and it's definitely very split. Um, some people think that they're not this, they're Chavistas from the Chavez government, and so they're not the same as them. They stayed behind, and now they're trying to come, and so those are they're calling them delinquents and whatever else. And um, while others are quite compassionate, and they're saying, "How can you be against a communist country and uh, against communism?" And then these people are fleeing, and you're sending them, trying to send them back. Great. So, uh, in about five minutes, we'll go to questions. But let me ask each of you uh, a question. Somebody to broaden the scope of what we've been talking so far. So back to the Supreme Court. I mean, if we see
the challenge of the border, whether it's chaotic or more, you know, whatever you want to call it, but certainly the perception that the border is out of control. How do you just as a Supreme Court watcher think that that affects the Supreme Court and its rulings? Is it essentially another way of asking you, is the Supreme Court immune from sub-development like this, or is it highly influenced by developments like this? I think it's probably somewhere in between moves. I would never describe the Supreme Court as immune from what's happening in the world, though they often will, individual justices will make statements like the consequences of our opinions are irrelevant to us or what public opinion consists of is ir irrelevant to us. People like to point to a very poignant example that led to a sea change in the law. And that is in 2001, 2002, when the Supreme Court was about to hear uh, its first case, or maybe it was a one of the subsequent cases about detention at Guantanamo after 9-11, uh, the photos from Abu Ghraib came out. Um, and that, that concretized in the minds of the justices, or so the narrative goes, uh, the potential consequences, severe um, dis distort, disorienting consequences of the so-called war on terror at the time. And that led to a restraint on the executive's power in the, the case the course heard, court heard. That's speculation, um, but the, the timing and the way in which the opinion came out that was somewhat of a surprise is suggestive. I, I do think though that it could cut both ways, right? Um, I think for, for some people, the recognition of the humanitarian consequences of the influx at the border and the limitations on the government's authority might lead them to, to grant the executive more leeway to read parole generously, that sort of thing. But I do think you also see in the opinions, particularly of someone like Justice Alito, uh, this concern that, that Sandra was talking about before about the effects of immigration on crime rates and the fear that people will abscond if they're not detained. That, that's there as a justification in some of these lower court opinions on the enforcement priorities memo is a reason um, to not allow the executive to evade what the court believes to be a mandatory detention directive from Congress in the statute. In a lot of the court's detention jurisprudence, again, written by Justice Alito, the concern about um, someone's, um, allowing someone to be released and then the uh, effects on the states of crime and disorder and, um, and general need to protect uh, welfare and, and the distribution of resources from citizens to caring for immigrants affects the way that they perceive the executive's authority. And you don't have to look beyond the opinions themselves to see that. And so uh, it's hard to imagine that on some level, it won't, uh, what's happening with the border won't affect the way decisions get made. It will just um, depend on who's, who's you know, looking at the data and what they bring to that as part of their priors in the first place, and then whether or not they choose to acknowledge it or shroud it in some view about what the government has or has not shown as part of the evidence to support its policies. Great. And Christy, to you, so this is a more overall picture. So you are one of our few people who has some understanding of the pulse of the Republican lawmakers. Uh, so on this optimistic and uh, and pessimistic spectrum. In the short term, medium term, where do you see kind of a, a sweet spot between center right and center left coming to some agreement on immigration? Well, I think at some point, you know, they're going to be forced to have to kind of grapple with what is happening at the border. Uh, so, you know, I, I, um, I think, you know, we all saw border numbers came out yesterday. We're, st we're seeing a pretty staggering change from um, the, the kinds of arrivals that are happening on our southern border. Uh, I think we're about to see um, Venezuelans and Cubans and Nicaraguans surpass the combined total of Mexicans and Salvadorans and um, Hondurans that have been crossing uh, just over the, the last few years. And I think that that is going to be kind of the next big push for potentially changing the way that we're handling asylum seekers on, on the southern border, um, or at least fingers crossed. Uh, you know, I think as we, we look into um, a next Congress, we're going to be talking a lot about those issues. Uh, Republicans want to talk a lot about labor issues. Uh, 
uh, which isn't just a Republican issue, but is also, um, you know, important for Democrats. We're going to be thinking a lot about competition, um, and in particular, competition with China. And of course, you know, security is always um, at, at, on uh, top of mind for uh, for Republicans in particular. I do want to say, because you mentioned hope, that last night Congress cleared a standalone immigration bill, which defies all logic. Uh, but it was the, the Bridging the Gap for New Americans Act, which basically allows uh, DOL to examine some of the factors that keep um, immigrants and refugees from um, finding employment uh, with their foreign degrees or their foreign credentials. It's a very small and a very limited bill, but I think that it points to you know, this constant idea that there, there may be a sliver of hope to move something. And if it takes passing kind of small bills like this to build the trust that we know that lawmakers need in order to you know, do the kind of give and take on, on certain bigger pieces of immigration reform, then we're headed in the right direction. So if I had to end on an up note, that's the one that I would I would choose. We like that. We like <laughs> sweet spots. So people who want to ask questions can start lining themselves. In the meantime, I'll ask Suzanne the last question, which I really cannot help asking you, just <laughs> having talked to you uh, as a prominent reporter, as just a reporter covering immigration for the last many years. How have you seen how different is covering immigration today than it was than when you entered the field? I, I, um, I, it, it's a good question. I, I, I mark my, I use the marker as before 9-11 and after 9-11 because I was, you know, I was uh, covering, started covering immigration in 2000 up in Washington. And I, I remember going to hearings and, and um, the members, um, particularly in the Senate, were just climbing all over themselves to talk about their immigration stories. And my grandfather came and my great grandfather came and whatever. Um, Brownback, um, uh, Senator McCain at the time, uh, you know, uh, really being moved by a story of, of a young girl um, and her bloated body showing up uh, in, in the river in, uh, in Arizona and, and that affecting him wanting to come up with some kind of immigration reform. But as right after 9-11, everything just shifted. I mean, it was instant. And everybody who was coming was a terrorist and we had to stop everybody in the Patriot Act. And I think it has just gone diminished and diminished from there. And so I, I kind of, I, you know, I'm waiting for that point where, that Christy's talking about where, you know, I was around when the whole enchilada was proposed. I don't know if you all know about that, but that was a congressional immigration reform that Bush proposed. And I guess maybe the next step is, is um, uh, what do you call it? Piecemeal. <laughs> That's Thank you. So let's go to the question and answer session. And... Thanks, Abel. Hi, working, oh, we're working. Hey. Hi. Good to see you all. Teresa Brown, Bipartisan Policy Center. I, I want to get back to sort of the, the focus on the courts. Um, and I think you raised earlier on sort of where we are in sort of the politicization of the courts. And I do think there's been polling out there that say that, you know, the public is, you know, thinking that the courts are more politicized than they used to be. Trying to think back to the origins of where we got now. I mean, certainly there was a move on the right for a long time talking about activist courts and, and very upset that what they thought were very liberal judges were moving things in one direction. And now we sort of see the progressive side claiming the same. Um, okay, another, another one. Um, and our you know Connecticut Attorney General this morning sort of said, well, yeah, the shoe's on the other foot right now. Um, and it makes me wonder whether, at least in the immigration world, even though this is not unique to immigration, we need to think more strategically about the litigation that we do take on uh, in the current environment. Um, not just because of we don't know where all the precedents are going to go, but thinking ahead to, okay, if the other side, if we have, if we have a change in administration and the other side starts suing, can these precedents be used against us, as you, as you mentioned um, about you know, the, the cases in MPP. So um, I think that's that's something I just want to think about in the context of where we are today with immigration litigation in the courts. Thank you. Uh, Christina, you're the closest to talking. Sure. I, I have a, a few thoughts about that problem, but I do think it's an intractable one. There are people who, uh, especially the level of Supreme Court litigators who uh, 
increasingly give a great deal of thought about whether to pursue a case all the way to the court with a view to what kind of precedent it might set. Uh, that, of course, doesn't address the question of what happens in the lower courts. Sorry about the, <laughs> the emergency siren passing by. But uh, and, and I think that you, you cannot evade litigation on these questions altogether. One of the effects of the nationwide injunction and uh, the use of procedural tools that can be done on both sides, it doesn't have a particular ideological valence to stop policy in its tracks has been uh, on the government and the way that it tries to formulate policies to make them as litigation proof as possible. I think that it, it does have a constraining effect and uh, you might see less creative use of statutory authority than in the past, but then you also see efforts like a, a rule, a notice and comment rule to fortify DACA as opposed to a more elaborate, mem elaborate memorandum. In 2012, we would have said there's no reason to send this to notice and comment rulemaking. Um, and so it's it, it might not succeed as a strategy, but that is that is a way to address what's happening in the courts is to try to satisfy some of those concerns and still get policy through. That will inevitably slow things down, which is part of the dilemma. I, I think that the, the problem of the politicization of the courts is one that's tied to deep fissures in our political culture that don't have an obvious solution. And immigration is both contributing to it and being affected by those uh, fissures. I, I think that courts have always been political. It's not like we are living some dystopian alternative to a neutral past when you had judges who made decisions without regard to ideology. But it does seem to not only to have gotten worse, but to um, to be the courts have become a place where a lot of disputes that might have been resolved in, in politics are increasingly going. Some of that has to do with inaction in Congress and the fact that a lot of policymaking is happening through the executive branch. And so there's more opportunity to challenge for procedural reasons and, and other reasons. And, and so perhaps some of the answer to these problems is for Congress to act more. Um, but that again <laughs> is inhibited by the divides that exist in our political culture that are, are driving a lot of the dynamics that we're, we're talking about. So where the solution lies, I'm, I'm not sure, but all of these things are related. Great, thank you. Uh, let, me, let me take a question there. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Sabel Nunez. I'm the executive director of the Central American Resource Center, and we actually are one of the organizations that have been receiving the buses from Texas mm -hmm. and Arizona. Um, I do want to sort of ask a question about, you know, a lot of politicians do good things with bad intentions. Um, the, what what this, both governors are doing are for political reasons, but for some of the immigrants on the buses, you know, it's been an incredible help, right? Because it's getting closer to, to where they want to be. Uh, is this a model of, of how we should receive immigrants? And what would that look like? Because ultimately, it's about everybody sharing the burden, right? So you have the states helping them get to where they need to go in the interior of the, of, of the country. You have the cities having to provide integration services. And isn't that what we would want? And how, what would that look like if instead of using it as a political stunt, it was actually something that was funded at all levels, at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level? And what do you think? And I know this, we're, we're talking dream here, but what would that look like? And, and what would be the potential hurdles, you know, in, in terms of sort of the legality of, of that? Suzanne, is this what do you think Governor Abbott was hoping for? Or? Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, I think he's he's right, and I think there are people that are saying, hey, it's great. You know, um, for the Salvadoreños, I mean, I know that uh, it, it, there, there are many in – in this area of the country and you know having you know uh, i've always i knew the process was usually they would go to a nonprofit and the nonprofit would call a, they would have a phone number they would call that person try to get them to buy them a bus ticket or if they didn't have it they would use their money the nonprofits only have so much there are only so many nonprofits working in texas um and and their resources are strained so there are people that are saying, hey, if he wants to send them closer to where they are, and my understanding is that like, when they send them to New York, the asylum courts in New York are much more likely to, they have a higher granting of asylum rate than in Texas. So um, I, I've asked that question too. I mean, I've asked that question, you know, and thinking about it as a reporting story is, is this 
the way it should be done because I know that advocates are were against detention centers even when the Obama administration had what it called a family center. So what's this? What what can be acceptable to uh, to advocates and to the other side? So Christy, I have two questions from online. I think they both go to you. Uh, one is sort of I'm not sure anyone knows the answer, but the question is to you: When exactly will the court decide about DACA? And two is that. Do you, why do you think that Hannon might have lifted his stay if the administration had gone further? Um, sure. So, I mean, the answer to the first question is I have no idea. Uh, I think that anybody's guess is as good as any guess that I could come up with. Um, there is some idea floating around that we might hear from the Fifth Circuit in the next couple of weeks, and then the Supreme Court would likely hear it in 2023 sometime, but I don't think that there's a there's any um, kind of clear metric or idea that we could use behind when when we'll see any of those decisions. Um, I think that the Judge Hainan is still um, a, a kind of wild card in this in this whole process. There is certainly a scenario by which um, you know if I think if the administration had responded too strongly or tried to expand uh, the DACA program in rewriting uh, the regulation, that Judge Hainan could have lifted his own stay. He's certainly allowed to do that um, and. You know, for me, that's always sort of been this um, kind of niggling concern in the back of my mind uh, that we could immediately stop having DACA renewals. And uh, that's certainly not something that I think would be a good or smart policy. Uh, and of course, you know, there is, there are scenarios, you know, in the way that cases work through courts where this could end up going back to a district court judge who could then decide to do whatever he wants to do on, you know, continuing uh, a stay, not continuing a stay, applying it to renewals, processing the new applications. I mean, whatever it is that, that they want to do. Um, so I think that there's just a lot of question marks about what we're going to see in this ruling. And it's a worst case scenario because we all have to just wait and see and then move as fast as we possibly can as sort of advocates in this space to try and convince lawmakers that they need to act simultaneous to all of this court action. And I think that's the, the biggest thing. Okay. Uh, I know there's one more question, but I'll go to one more question online uh, because it does go to MPP. And Christina, I think you're online for this just because you're the closest we have here who has knows something what the administration may actually be doing. So what is the current status of MPP after the Supreme Court sent it back to the to the court in terms of its actual implementation? So I, I have no particular insight into operational details, but there is an effort to wind it down. And, and that entails uh, when people appear for their uh, court dates, then they're taken out of the program. Um, and then they can proceed with their, um, their whatever processes it is that they're in inside the United States. And there's, of course, no, there are no new enrollments in the program. That's, that's the status quo. I think there's some concern that it's not happening quickly enough. Uh, but you know, it is, a, it is a logistical challenge um, to figure out how to get people uh, to the country. And it's possible it could be done more rapidly than it is being done now. But um, it's, at, at least the administration is touting what it's doing now is, is a bit more orderly and organized than the original effort to begin unwinding MPP. But the case is back with the district court. And if the district court decides that the administration was arbitrary and capricious in its decision to uh, rescind MPP, then in a way we're back where we started. I think the one thing that I didn't mention before that might make the outcome in this case different uh, than we, what we might otherwise expect with the application of arbitrary and capricious review is that one of the reasons that the Supreme Court cited for um, for reversing the the district court uh, was and and criticizing the use of the injunction was the effect it had on foreign policy of the United States. The idea that a district court could force the federal government into negotiations with Mexico and, and force two countries to adopt a policy that neither wants uh, seems like separation of powers run amok. And I, I think the court's recognition of the foreign affairs dimension of this uh, might be enough maybe not for the district court to say, okay, this is something that the executive branch has the authority to do, but certainly for the Supreme Court to say, whatever we think about arbitrary capricious review when it comes to domestic policy, this is a, a policy that we cannot force upon the federal government, which, is, would, which would be the effect 
of declaring the rescission arbitrary and capricious. So if I had to predict how it would all work out in the end, that's what I would say. And so that means that it makes sense for the administration to keep working on unwinding it, for advocates to put whatever pressure is necessary to make it happen more quickly and uh, to try to shift attention to adjudicating cases inside the United States under the new asylum rule and otherwise. So that will have to be the last question, but please go ahead. Okay. Oh. Great. Um, hi. So my question for y'all was, um, you were mentioning that there might be a change in the way some conservatives talk about immigrants when they're, if they're, if, when we're having that shift to mostly Nicaraguans and Venezuelans and, and such um, people escaping uh, failed communist regimes. Um, my question is how wise that is, because it's happened in the past, right, um, with Cubans especially. Um, but I think we're still more likely to get mostly people escaping climate change and, and um, events like that. I've definitely talked to clients who, you know, hurricanes a couple of years ago from Central America went by and destroyed the house and then now they're here. Um, so I, I don't know how much I want to focus on that because it's not always the case and the people escaping those situations maybe deserve help too. <laughs> yeah, I just want to clarify that um, I don't think that there's going to be a shift. I think that I know that there are people now saying, um, you know, that they're coming from communist countries. And so they're criticizing the Senator Marco Rubio or uh, Diaz Ballard, who are always, um, you know, talking about com communism and, and against it and, you know, whatever. And, and they said, listen, you can't be saying one and then denying these people entry here. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I, I also think that, you know, this, we're dealing with asylees, asylum seekers, mm -hmm. and the, the, the language has so changed on, who these people are. I mean, it, it, there used to be sort of these distinctions made and now uh, people that don't want to see them coming are sort of lumping them all and saying they're all, um, you know, there are, you know, what the words that they use, I, you know, I hate to. And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, some of the, 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 the extremism, the, 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 the white supremacy that is a reality in, in all of our debate that we're having now that, you know, infiltrates every part of immigration from, you know, from uh, you know just the vigilantes to the 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 off the agents you know it, it exists and so i i don't know that people will ever come there are some people who will never come to accept this as a reality it really just comes down to you know what these policies are you know i i, I don't get to write opinion but as as an observer of this for so long i have wondered when it we're going to come to the the point where we no longer think of immigration as static, that it just happens, we're going to pass a bill and it's all going to be solved. And I think that happens a lot when people in, in general. And, and applause. Uh, we will conclude this panel. Uh, help me, help me um, thank uh, Suzanne Gambau, Christy DePena, and Christina Rodriguez for an excellent conversation. We could go all day, but the governor is here oh. and I would expect, please, all of you uh, stay seated uh, while we change this configuration here for the governor to come. And thank you so much all, and we'll see you soon.